Відразу, в тому початку, скажу, що у нас сьогодні також синхронний переклад з англійської на українську. Ми дуже вдячні нашим перекладачам Олесі Камалітниковій та Івану Дейнесу за їхню роботу. Так що, будь ласка, хто потребує перекладу, може взяти наушниковий набір. Так що, Олесі. Так, я спрятую в англійську. Я дуже вдячний Afternoon, uh, architectural historian Lukas Stanek, uh, critical geographer and researcher Zoltan Ginelli, and uh, curator and researcher Esther Sakas. Uh, with the, so we are really happy that we start this uh, day. We will have several events in a row, in a way, uh, with the discussion titled "Global Socialism and Decolonization in Eastern Europe and the Perspective of Contemporary Art." And I am very, very grateful to Esther Sakas for conceiving this debate because I consider uh, this topicality as well as the uh, problematic field that the Transparency Movement exhibition that this debate re is related to, which you can see just next to this room in the conference hall. I think these uh, problematic fields are really central to the very modus operandi of the East Europe Biennial Alliance. Uh, because um, mm, for, sev for several reasons, uh, exhibition-wise, as I said, concept-wise, but also institution-wise. I think that in general this topic, which is also reflected even in the title of this event, is, uh, as we were just discussing, is uh, functioning, uh, at least for me, but also I think in our context in general, is function it really functions like an eye-opener. Because this uh, narrative, this kind of research, and this really new uh, understanding of the 20th century history of Eastern Europe in relation to the global, so uh, global South and other peripheries is really something which is not totally present here. It's pretty often it's just invisible, unseen. And also, as we were discussing with Lucas, for instance, sometimes when this story, this narrative is being revealed, it also can face some harsh rejection even because of this uh, uneasy connection. And on the other hand, uh, to position this debate uh, in our local realities, I think that there are, of course, two key words which are also in the title of this debate, which are, of course, socialism and decolonization. And they are very perversely connected here in Ukraine. Because uh, it's really interesting because what we will hear is a bit different story than what we are used to. Because in our situation, the connection between the two is a bit different from the point where both notions, especially decolonization ones, are coming from. What I mean here, of course, that uh, because of this whole uh, decommunization hysteria, how easily we all lost our socialist past. We just surrendered to it in a way because of the war, of course, and then stuff. But at the same time, I think it's also, that's why we are so eager today to, to talk about, in the public discourse here, to talk about decolonization, which is exactly because we, we consider socialist past as being colonized, that we were colonized. So it's really, it's a, a bit like upside down situation in that regard. So thank you so much uh, again for uh, coming here, and I'm really pleased to introduce uh, Esther Sakas in more detail. She's a curator, researcher, and a member of Hof Biennale Budapest. And currently she is a PhD candidate at the University of Amsterdam at the Amsterdam School for Cultural Analysis. Previously she worked at Transit Hungary where she, uh, among other things, co-edited co the online art magazine Mesosfera. She also co -edited, uh, is co-edited in a forthcoming anthology Solidarity Must Be Defended and her research revolves around grassroots art organizing, uh, connections between the Global South and uh, Eastern Europe, as well as exhibitions, for exhibitional forms of research. Thank you so much again. Well, thank you so much, uh, Vasil, and again, <coughs> really thank you for uh, having us and, uh, and for the introduction, and it is uh, our and, and my great pleasure and honor to welcome with us uh, Lukas Stanek and Lukas Stanek and, and Zoltan 
primarily in person uh, and, and not online, which is really fantastic. Um, and uh, yeah, today, as Vasil also mentioned, today's discussion is organized in relation to the research exhibition Transfer Free Movement, Global Eastern Europe and Global South, uh, that brings together archival materials and contemporary artworks to look at the historical relationships and parallels between the Global South and Eastern Europe. And this exhibition, which curated together with Zoltan Binari, and was pres presented at Ob Biennale Budapest uh, this spring, and it is now on view just uh, in, in next doors, uh, in the conference hall at the House of Cinema in, in a new form, in a new adaptation that was speci specifically prepared for the Kiev um, Biennium. And uh, the panel discussion today uh, will revolve around uh, two main questions or points beyond what also Vassil mentioned. So on the one hand, the two talks uh, will bring forth case studies that demonstrate novel, under novel understandings of Eastern Europe's history in the 20th century, and uh, in particular, uh, as Lukas Stane put in his book, Architecture and Global Socialism, uh, the ways in which a view from the South offers a novel understanding not only of Cold War transfers, but also how Eastern Europe configures in competing networks and antagonistic processes. And on the other hand, I very much hope that we can also discuss another crucial point about methodology, methodology and sensitivity, about the ways in which the outcomes of this historical research are understood, written, presented, and exhibited. So Zoltan will introduce his research of a few uh, case studies, some of which are presented uh, in the Transparent Free Movement exhibition, and then uh, Lukas will introduce his book, Architecture and Global Socialism, Eastern Europe, West Africa, and the Middle East in the Cold War, as well as the concept of socialist world banking. Um, before um, I, I introduce them and I give the word to them, I would like to briefly uh, address the second point that I mentioned, is how, how we relate and how, how do we work with these historical uh, materials. And I would like to mention some of the blind spots and pitfalls within the field of art, uh, those that I all realized while curating this and also other exhibitions. And also I would like to add that uh, in my view, uh, the exhibition is, is not a finished product, especially if we're talking about the research exhibition, which the transport free movement is, uh, but it's a form of inquiry. So I feel, I believe that the, the exhibition can pose questions rather than present answers. Um, so some of, so I would like to um, pose a few questions that also are questions that uh, I, I don't have answers to necessarily, but I, I, I have this as a lines of questions that I keep asking myself. And these are how to curate history, how to go beyond presenting materials only from the perspective of Eastern Europe, and, also, and how to present these materials that also takes into account the relevancy of the, these materials from the perspective of the global south. How to acknowledge transnational connections in an exhibition setting. How to bring together archival materials and contemporary artworks in an exhibition and how to contextualize, in an Eastern European context, works of art whose thematics ranges from Marxism-Leninism in Angola, as it was the case with Monica de Miranda's work in the exhibition, Marxism in Bangladesh, and the long decline of the left in Bangladesh, as it is the case in the work of Naim Mohaimen in the exhibition, or the recollections of Namibian women who were brought to the GDR to train them as the regime-changing elite in Namibia when they returned, as in the case of the work of Katrin Winkler in the exhibition. Or the history and the critique of negritude, as in the case of uh, the work by Manchia Villavara in the exhibition. Or how racism existed uh, in Czechoslovakia against the socialist propaganda, as it is the case in the film, in the 1968 film by Krishna Vishwanath, Black and White. And also how to relate to our own family history 
that has ties to colonial uh, heritage, which was the case by Algerian artist Judith Flora Schumann. And lastly, which is a, a very also important question in, in the context of an exhibition, how to present materials in a way that does not repeat and reproduce hierarchical and colonial traditions. And, and at this point, I would like to give the word to uh, Zoltan Ginelli, and I would like to uh, introduce him. So Zoltan Ginelli is an independent researcher and a critical geographer, historian of of science and global historian. His research in the, is in the geographies of knowledge, word systems, analysis, and the histories of geography, colonialism, racism, with a focus on the historical relations between Eastern Europe and the global South, or the Third World. Between 2015 and 2019, he worked as an assistant researcher into 1989, after 1989, and Socialism Goes Global Project at the University of Oxford. Uh, Zoltan is currently working on two books, one for Cambridge University Press with James Matt and Peter Upper about the global history of Hungarian relations to colonialism and anti-colonialism in the long 20th century. And he founded the social media group Decolonizing Eastern Europe, which you can find on Facebook and Twitter. So Zoltan, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much for the kind introduction. I tried to start, notice that uh, the image has been clipped again, although we tried it before, it worked, so sorry about that. Uh, I'm very happy to be here in person, seeing you all in person. Um, this was like a more than two year project, us working together with Esther. It's actually a much bigger project than the exhibition itself, and what you can see here in Kiev is only a small portion of the bigger, big project. Uh, I'd like to draw your attention to the Decolonizing Eastern Europe group, which is on Facebook and Twitter. If you'd like to know more about these perspectives and understandings, which I'll talk about. And also the uh, website of the exhibition, which will be updated uh, during the Biennale with a lot of online material. Okay, so I'll basically talk about and through the Transparent Free Movement Art and Documentary Exhibition, uh, which was first featured in its fullest form in Budapest and speak about a couple of things, how historical research and documentary materials can inform, contextualize, and interact with art or artistic projects, uh, how to work from and think across collections, also colonial collections uh, in Eastern Europe, and how to think of exhibition as a network and as a platform and also as a practice to contest power relations and knowledge production. Uh, one of the main reasons to do this is because of that our historical perspectives in Eastern Europe are largely ruled and governed by hegemonic Western viewpoints, and there is a great degree of self-colonization going on in that respect. What I'll try to do, which will be a trick, uh, I think, is that I'll try to deposition or reposition global socialism, uh, to put it in a wider historical and geographical perspective, beyond, so into the interwar era and the post-1989 era. One of the reasons is because of the pro problematic leftist and progressive positions which reach back to the history of socialism, which are largely, I think, biased by Eurocentrism, which is very typical in Eastern Europe. Uh, I will be basing my talk on Hungarian examples predominantly. And this is actually one of the strategies we use, which I'll call uh, of course, well, it goes back to Beatrice Spivak's uh, strategic essentialism, I call it strategic nationalism, to focus on the canonized history of your uh, nation and open it up from the perspective of the interactions with the global south. So there's an accepted knowledge that all you have and you can deconstruct and intercept that knowledge through a, a new viewpoint which looks not at the west but at the interactions with, between Eastern Europe and Global South. And the transparent movement focuses on three main concepts, coloniality, peripherality, so this peripheral position, and migration, or we might also say movement or circulation. So we focus on the interactions, mostly, and this shows these vast transperipheral, 
interconnections between Eastern Europeans and those in the global south. So this movement is, so this is the movement part. The movement is also about forming the sort of, uh, it's also about the practice of forming a larger project, a movement of following this perspective to contest these hegemonic Western viewpoints from these perspectives based on East Europe, in East Europe and the global south. So just to be very brief, this is based on world systems theory, if you read Immanuel Wallerstein or many others, uh, which says that the modern capitalist world system is hierarchical, it's controlled by the hegemonic core, and there are these core periphery relations which uh, define your position as strategies of developing connections geographically, and, are, and your position is largely conditioned by the modes of integration which you have into this world system. So what this means for Eastern Europe is that Eastern Europe is in this curious in-between position, the semi-periphery, between the core and the periphery, sharing traits both in the core and the periphery. For example, in terms of race, Eastern Europeans were also racialized by Westerners. They were not quite white in many uh, moments of history. They were the peripheral or frustrated whites who want to become whites in order to share the privileges of the core, but we're also racialized by the core. And my term, the semi-peripheral semi -peripheral coloniality, means in this context, this in-betweenness between the colonizer and the colonized uh, position. So I think this year shows how we can open up this dichotomy uh, and to look at the various ways we connected and integrated into global colonialism. And this is where I think looking at the uh, relations between the periphery and the semi-periphery become really important, not looking from and to the West uh, to bypass this Euro and West centrism and also Occidentalism. So Eastern Europe has been looked upon as the core Europe, the whites, especially after 1989 globally, whilst it's not really true uh, because we also share a peripheral position globally. It's also about the memory politics of forgetting the socialist, especially socialist era, relations between the periphery and the semi-periphery due to a revanchist, nationalist, anti-communism, but also a selective forgetting during the socialist era. And we should also think about decolonialism as an approach, not as uh, a form of you know, Western self-colonization where we take concepts and frameworks from the West, for example, recently in politics, Black Lives Matter, but understanding our own histories of global integration through these interactions with the global South and how we have a shared position. So I think it's important to focus on the historical role also and position of history of within decolonization. Think about connections to Afro-Asian decolonization, which I'll talk about. And I'll try to provide these, uh, this historical overview of these shared peripheral, peripheral positions and also the role and position of East European global colonialism. There, what we commonly have is discourses that we never had colonies because, and therefore we have no responsibility for colonialism. That's the dominant discourse in East Europe. And race was invented and is used by the West and is an issue of the West and not of Eastern Europe, uh, and it's all connected to Western imperialism, which we do not share as Eastern Europeans. It was also used, this argument, to criticize the West in an anti-colonial agenda, which were, there were curiously conservative positions, but it was also used during the socialist era. So this Western anti-colonialism and, uh, anti and anti-imperialism against the West. But Eastern Europe has been imagined as an exclusive and ex exceptional space, Central European moral bubble. We have nothing to do with colonialism. And also there's a curious dividing line between the colonizers and the non-colonizer, which curiously run through along the Iron Curtain, dividing the Western and post-socialist countries. So what, but there's also, and this is the last aspect, competing local discourse of, of colonial victimization. So we were always colonized by the West. So the Eastern European region, as you can see in this map, 
uh, was an arena contested by various colonial imperial projects with racialized populations. So this is actually one way to be involved in the discourse around global colonialism and offers comparative analysis, analysis. If you look into these historical moments, you see this uh, German map of German population within Europe. Also, you could see uh, Russia or then Soviet Union. This is from the 70, uh, 1920s and the 30s was used by the Nazis to propagate colonization of the East by the Germans. So you can see that the region of Hungary is also uh, involved. And you can see that the Swabian Germans who settled in the Hungarian region on the other map. Uh, so they were both, they were German origin, but they were also Hungarian. And therefore they were, they were, uh, they became subjects of various colonial imaginaries and trajectories, both by the Germans and also by the Hungarians. And this becomes increasingly important if we talk about transcoloniality, which means that these, how these overlapping colonial projects uh, produced uh, these subjects of the colonies. When we look at how Hungarians went to the Swab, and many of these who were Swabian Hungarians went to the South America to become uh, colonists and settled there from the end of 19th century and the early 20th century, but also in two waves after the Second World War and in 1956 during the revolution. So they were considered white settlers, but they were also the products of the country's dependency. Uh, Eastern European uh, semi-peripherals meant that the, a lot of pop, there was a lot of out-migration and they were dependent on the remittances, so money spent, uh, sent back. And I like, wanted to talk about this also because, uh, not just because there were Hungarian colonies, right? And they were part of a wider colonial imaginaries and trajectories of elites in Hungary who developed Hungarian colonies. This is a, a mapping these colonies in Argentina, Paraguay, and Brazil, southern Brazil. We had settlements like Colony Arpad or Colony Petlem, but also because of the, this is a post-socialist process of, uh, of nationalist repatriation. Some of these people are taking back citizenship. And this is, very, this is a process which, connect, which is connected to Eastern Europe. So Russia is also doing this and many other East European countries. But it's also about the socialist era forgetting about these populations. And it also offers, uh, uh, it has the potential of creolizing our national histories and identities if we take these baggage populations, these colonies, former colonies, into our national histories. So uh, I think if we look at the socialist era, we should not take it as a unique political moment or project, but part of a long durée, so a long-term uh, structural mode of integration of Eastern Europeans into global capitalism and therefore global colonialism, uh, which produced these semi-peripheral discourses of race and coloniality. Uh, and it also contests, uh, I'll try to contest the Cold War paradigm by looking into these continuities of knowledge and expertise from the interwar era and the World War II experiences, uh, which influenced interactions with race and colonialism. Uh, and lastly, uh, we also have to think of not just uh, what was out there, but also the absences of the socialist era. So what they forgot uh, from these continuities coming from the interwar era, which influenced the socialist era. So one example which we look uh, at in our exhibition is a translation of Batuala, which was uh, the first so-called Negro novel where the main figure is a black African, uh, which was written in 1921 by René Maran, who was a French Guyanese, Guyanese uh, writer and also colonial official in West Africa and it immediately won the Goncourt Prize in Paris in 1921. And because of that, it was uh, translated into Hungarian pretty fast by Dejan Kostolani, who was a renowned uh, writer and poet, uh, so into Hungarian. And this shows the deeper history uh, of Pan-Africanism and negritude in the interwar, which ranges back to the interwar era. René Maran was a prime figure in the, these in the negritude movement, which is about uh, focusing on black African history and identities and culture in order to contest colonialism. And actually this novel was a critique of French colonialism. 
But interestingly, in the Hungarian translation, this was de-emphasized, and the position of the writer, the, 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 the way the masterful artistic writing style of René Maran was put in the forefront by Postani, who was now actually, uh, recently they discovered his anti-Semitic writings too, so again, you have another layer of understanding this kind of translation. And he was a uh, prime member of the uh, uh, editorial board of Nugat, which is called West, uh, which is a journal hungry in the early, in the interwar period, which was very West-centric. So then Raist was taken from the West as a discourse, and it was criticized, Batola was criticized because of centering on race, which was said to be uh, a Western import. We don't have race. We don't need the Negro figure in our culture to think of, uh, uh, of, of the issues of colonialism. Okay, and lastly, uh, this also connects to a wider history of uh, the folk writers in Hungary uh, in the interwar era who shared this connection to a world of literature uh, through Paris and this French connection to colonialism. Uh, there were writers who were thinking about the Hungarian colony, uh, how we are subjugated by the West and we need to contest this, which showed parallels with the Negritude movement, which we tried to show in the ex exhibition. But this part was shown in Budapest uh, Park. So how to reach for an authentic culture uh, and also race to contest Western dependency. And another example is Miklos Radnot, who was a Jewish uh, writer, very close to the then illegal communist movement, but also religious, he was a Catholic. And he was part of this milieu of leftist leaning poets like Attila Yosef, who is very famous internationally, who became very influential later during uh, socialism. Uh, he had a French degree and he was influenced by French avant-garde, including exoticism, neo-primitivism, connected to Apollinaire and also connected to Picasso, so there was a wider uh, cultural uh, milieu. Uh, he was also inspired by African and South Asian literature. And he went in 1931 to Paris, he was very poor, but he attended various, uh, he attended uh, oftentimes the 1931 colonial exhibition, and he felt solidarity for the African blacks who were uh, the tribesmen who were presented in human zoos. So there's, uh, in the middle you can see his postcards he sent back home, uh, depicting these people. Uh, his experience of a racist anti-Semitic Hungary under the state governor Miklos Horthy uh, and the rise of fascism and Nazism influenced him to connect his Jewish position via this world literature to the African figure. So many of his poems were inspired by this. Uh, he was partly connected to the illegal uh, communist movement and the Song of the Negro poem book uh, that he did was distributed under library desks. So it was an illegal piece. Never sold, they never sold a piece of this. He actually followed his, uh, uh, the negritude uh, style and expression and topics. The pureness and authenticity of tales and folklore but also he was prone to the exoticization of the African as fresh, bodily, and sensual. Uh, and uh, the Negro character who comes from this natural environment ventures into the urban setting of capitalist modernity is, in the, is at the center of the story. Uh, Eloy Cerny, a forgotten graphic designer, did some of the Zignolan cuts, uh, which were presented by the, with the permission of his granddaughter. He also did this uh, edited book of translations of African tales and poems called Karunga in 1944, which was edited by Ishtvan Kende, an important uh, Jewish African history reporter during socialism, which was republished in 1957. So it was used as an item in, uh, during Afro-Asian decolonization, so as a cultural tool. And about memory politics, uh, Radnoti was brutally murdered in 1944 while being interned. Uh, during the forced march to Germany. So later on, he was positioned as a socialist era, anti-racist hero. However, after 1989, all these aspects have been largely forgotten. So these aspects of African literature. And the third example is Ilish Kotzeir, who was uh, also Jewish, very active in the communist movement. He had various writings about Jewish culture and identity, connected to nativism, folklore, 
the historic origin or the scale, and published mostly in Hungarian. He had this multiple diasporic identity being uh, connected to Czech, even to Czechoslovakia and Transylvania. And he actually wrote the first Hungarian Negro novel in 1936, which was a critique of Hitler and Nazism after his Berlin trip. And previously it was translated into, Ger into English by the Germans and published it in the USA to criticize racism and the contemporary lynchings. It's a story is about Nunjengezi, a black African from West Africa going to Paris and later to the USA, and later he got lynched uh, in the USA. So that's the story. Uh, and But the spirit of the Congo, of Pan-Africanism, uh, must live on. So that's the basic uh, message. Uh, as he got, he, so he gets close to pan, the Pan-Africanist movement in Paris. So again, you see these, uh, these topics which are featured in Negritude and also you could see in God Knows Who. Uh, but in his case, it's interesting because he was also a Zionist. He settled in Israel in 1959. And he wrote this book, which was originally published in 1924, uh, but then republished during the Six-Day Arab-Israeli War in 1967, uh, about the dream colonist, about the, uh, the Jewish colonist who is then regarded as white. So he was largely forgotten because of the social theory relations which were anti-Israel and pro-Palestine. Okay, and uh, a huge topic, but just to show like three aspects of how Hungarians tried to construct competing colonial parallels with the global south or the third world at that time, and also with a non-aligned movement, which connects also to this kind of pan-Africanist movement that I talked about. The three instances, as one is the anti-communist uh, anti refugees who fled from Sovietization, the second uh, example is uh, all the reformist socialists during the 1956 revolution against the Soviet Union uh, in Hungary. Uh, and the third is the communists who then tried to develop relations with the third world after the 1956 revolution, 56 revolution to open up uh, and uh, to contest Western dependencies. So they had the shared Western interest with uh, these newly independent post-colonial countries. So the three examples show the first case of the anti-communists is how Prime Minister Ferenc Nagy uh, influenced the first Bandung, first Afro-Asian conference in Bandung to include the discourse of Soviet colonialism so that Eastern Europeans could be included in the discourse of anti-colonialism, right? But this was a pro-USA position because he was in New York. Uh, and the second is how hun these Hungarians, like Istvan Bibo, for, uh, in important state minister, and uh, also Arpa Günz, who later became the president of Hungary after 1989, were very important, he was young at that time, in trying to connect to Indian attaches and diplomats to persuade Nehru to intervene in the conflict and let uh, India uh, mediate between Soviet Union and Hungary, and also to uh, join the non-aligned movement. So a, a version of non-alignedness and also a Yugoslav path of socialism. It failed with the revolution. And in the third case, I look at how Hungarian development economists and various experts connect to the uh, co constructing the first seven-year plan of Ghana. And I focus on this example uh, with the figure of Jozef Bognar in the middle because Ghana was uh, also a, a, a very important node of uh, various expertise transnationally uh, and also uh, part of the non-aligned movement and also uh, Kwame Nkrumah, the president was the leader of, uh, of Pan-Africanism. Okay, so just to paddle forward, the, I have two uh, short examples in the end which we featured. One is the architectural projects of Hungarians uh, in the Global South. Uh, and the second, which I'll talk about, will be the Cuban workers, which is also featured in the Kia Biennale. So the architecture projects are very important because uh, as uh, you can read in Lukas Stanek's uh, work, uh, if we not focus on uh, the aesthetic form of architecture, but on the, the, the social functions that this architecture a played uh, in place where they were developed in these export projects. In this case, you could see images from Algeria 
schools, housing projects, hospitals, and such infrastructural developments, uh, then you can see how Eastern Europeans influenced the uh, urbanization processes and the very life, everyday lives of these people. If you focus on the interactions of uh, these people, the experts, and also how, uh, how um, uh, also how Hungarian models were exported of housing project, for example, or in this case, uh, hospital development, which was a prime export project. You can see that uh, one of these hospitals are from Syria is featured on a textbook on hospital planning in Hungary. And there are vast mega projects like Kalabar, uh, who was developed by, led by Charles Poloni in uh, Biafra, southern Nigeria, and also like the uh, stadium in Algiers, which was also built by Hungarians. So this is a flagship project too. So again, focusing on labor and these interactions is much more important than focusing on you know, architectural form. These, uh, many of these could, uh, buildings could be like factories or other you know, uh, infrastructural developments, which are not de-emphasized and not really collected. So this is from Ipar Ferb Archive State Company. The whole archive is not really collected in Hungary, so it's just being digitized. Okay, and lastly, the Cuban guest workers in Hungary who came in 1982. So in the 1980s was a period when uh, this sort of whitening out process was intact because uh, the Cubans were actually the first um, targets of anti-racism during socialism, connected to, for example, the emergence of the skinhead subculture. So we look at the personal interactions of uh, Cubans who went to textile factories in Hungary to work there as guest workers, and then all of these, uh, most of these migrant workers left after the system changed. And their memory, their memory has been forgotten officially. So I'll just wrap up and start about the time, about these questions which I think uh, sort of sum up this overview. I think that the concept of decolonization and whiteness should be understood from this semi-peripheral position in Eastern Europe. And I think that the transparency offers a, you know, a perspective or a lens to look at the absences to the peripheral positions which are interconnected. And we should think about how to, the, about networking the exhibition and contextualizing in global historical perspective. And also uh, propose, I propose a multifocal historical research as a resource for our project to think from these historical experiences when we're doing art. And we should, I think, uh, East European art should also focus on the diasporic self and networks as a position and as a resource. Think about the Latin American example, which I talked about. So thank you very much, and sorry, sorry about the time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dorka. And uh, so I would like to introduce uh, Lucas. Lucas Tanekel, and then afterwards we will have uh, questions and time for uh, discussion. So Lucas Tanek is a professor of architectural history at the Manchester School of Architecture at the University of Manchester. He authored Henri Lafont, Dot on Space Architecture, Urban Research, and the Production of Theory, published by the University of Minnesota Press uh, in 2011, and in 2000. Um, 2020, he published Architecture in Global Socialism, Eastern Europe, West Africa, uh, and the Middle East in the Cold War, which he will introduce um, shortly. And uh, currently, he's, uh, he's, um, he studies the Africanization of Ghanaian architecture as part of the Central Africa program at the Canadian Center for Architecture. Besides Manchester, he taught at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich, the Harvard University Graduate School of Design, and the University of Michigan. Thank you very much again, Luca, for being with us here. We are very happy. Th thank you so much. I'm really delighted to be here in this amazing city, which I, I had a chance to look at, and you know, passionately. So, I would like to introduce uh, my book, uh, which is called Architecture and Global Socialism. It was published last year by Princeton University Press. This is a book about the experience of collaboration. And it shows how, during the Cold War, architects, planners, and construction companies from socialist Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union collaborated 
with their counterparts in West Africa and the Middle East and elsewhere. And so the book is a portrait of five siblings, namely Accra in uh, Ghana, Lagos in Nigeria, Baghdad in Iraq, Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates, and Kuwait City. And the book narrates how the, these siblings were co-produced by the deployment of architectural resources in socialist Europe. So the book in architectural history, and um, I would like to kind of briefly flip through it so that you have a sense of some of its material, but also of its structure. So this is the first uh, chapter, the introduction, which discusses, you know, briefly things like these, a Soviet project in China, but also Hungarian uh, and the Romanian and Yugoslav project in Sub-Saharan Africa. And this is already the second chapter, which uh, talks about uh, Ghana in the 1960s with a number of, as you see, modernist buildings, with this one being the case study that's, a, that's an Eastern European Ghanaian project in uh, Accra. Uh, and this is the following chapter, which discusses Nigeria, including uh, Hungarian urban design and regional design projects for uh, parts of the country, but here also side projects from Romania, and a number of public buildings, highly visible buildings designed by Yugoslav, Yugoslavs. Uh, and this is the following chapter, focused on Baghdad and this master plan of the city is one of the key case studies here. But as you can see also, it's put, has been put, it was prepared by a number of preliminary studies on housing and heritage. But the chapter also discusses things like these, uh, Comic Con collaboration within uh, Baghdad, military infrastructure by East Germany, public buildings and industrial facilities. And this is uh, a Bulgarian project in Abu Dhabi and a very prominent one, the City Hall. And uh, the, the chapter discusses a number of Bulgarian uh, projects in the Gulf, but also Czechoslovak and others from uh, Eastern Europe. But also it discusses a number of designs which were produced by architects from Eastern Europe who were privately employed in private offices in the Gulf. And so as this flip through already suggests, um, architects from socialist countries were part of this accelerated mobility of architecture since World War II. And they work, as we perhaps could also see in the more contemporary images, their work continues to impact the uh, processes of urbanization in a number of locations until today. In recent years, scholars pointed out the various conveyors of architectural mobility since World War II. They wrote about late colonial and post-colonial networks from Western Europe. They wrote about technical assistance from the United States. They wrote about international organizations such as the UN and uh, networks of uh, economic globalization. And so what the book does is to complement this research by focusing on the global network of socialist countries a topic which until recently has been completely absent in the historiography of architecture. Certainly when I started this project 12 years ago, nobody wrote about that. And I think that absence in itself is an interesting question and perhaps we can come back to it later. Clearly one of the reasons for this absence was the, was the difficulty in their access to sources. And so I believe that one of the contributions of this book is really to bring to the fore archival material from public and private archives in Eastern Europe, in West Africa, and in the Middle East. But I also believe that the reason for, for this absence has been capitalist triumphalism that after the end of the Cold War equated architectural globalization with westernization, with Americanization, and then retroactively projected this narrative into the history of architecture since World War II. By contrast, this book um, points at the heterogeneity and multiplicity of networks which contributed to architecture becoming worldwide. And this included the heterogeneity and multiplicity of socialist networks themselves, including the Soviet Yugoslav split uh, in the late 40s, uh, but also the split between the Soviet Union and China a bit later. Now, the opening of the socialist countries towards the decolonizing countries from, um, uh, res resulted from a shift in the Soviet policies in the 1950s. 
Under Khrushchev, the Soviets offered political, economic, and technical assistance to the decolonizing world in direct competition with the West. Many leaders of independent countries uh, in Africa and Asia were attracted to the Soviet offers. Some, including Kwame Nkrumah in uh, Ghana, pursued the socialist model of development, which, as you know, emphasized state-centered industrialization, collectivization of agriculture, and justice-oriented welfare distribution. However, the collaboration with uh, socialist countries was attractive also to those African and Asian governments that did not follow the socialist development model. For example, Nigeria. Uh, Nigerian governments welcomed Eastern European state enterprises as a means to stimulate economic competition between foreign investors in the country and in order to fill shortages of professional labor. And this is important because uh, it shows that architectural mobilities from socialist Europe reached far beyond Soviet client states. Now, the Eastern European countries had their own uh, ideological aims, geopolitical objectives, and economic interests to engage with West Africa and the Middle East. And these aims and objectives were evolving from the 1950s to the 1980s, and they differed from country to country. And, uh, and this is, again, a kind of an important argument of this book, is to get rid of that vision of the, of the Soviet Union and the socialist countries as kind of one homogenous Soviet bloc. Uh, an important threshold for many countries in this respect was the embargo, oil embargo of 1973. As you know, the profits of oil producing countries were deposited in Western financial institutions. And then they were lent to the socialist countries uh, intent on modernizing the economies. Yet that industrial leap that would have allowed them to pay back the debts that are material and accordingly, Hungary, Poland, Romania, East Germany, uh, Bulgaria responded by boosting their exports in order to obtain convertible currencies. And this did include very much the export of design and construction services. In my book, I study these processes from the perspective of architectural labor. And I started with a simple understanding of architectural labor uh, as what architects were hired to do as architects. In other words, what architects were paid to do as architects. And this ostensibly reductive um, definition reveals actually a range of work involved. And it included design labor, but also construction supervision, administration, legislation, research, and education. It also, and, and, and so this is quite important because uh, this focus on labor does not simply mean that these architects were doing many things. It also means, conceptually, that architectural labor, when mobilized, was many things. Uh, it uh, was a technological expertise that was adapted to the conditions on the ground. It was an experience of modernization that was translated uh, to, to fit the demands of local commissioners. But it was also a fungible resource that was exported. And it is in this latter modality, as an exported resource, the mobility of architectural labor was defined by the political economy of foreign trade in state socialism. Now, in order to understand the multiplicity of these exchanges, but also the antagonistic character. Uh, in the book, I developed the concept of word making. And my materialist historical reading of this concept goes back to Henri Lefebvre and his theorizing of mondialisation. Neither a translation of the English globalization nor a simple alternative to it. That term mondialisation in Lefebvre's work pointed at the world as a historically a specific dimension of social practice. The world as a historically specific dimension of social practice. During the 1970s, Lefebvre discussed mondialization as central to the urbanization processes around the planet and argued that practices of space production were informed 
by alternative imaginations of the world. These imaginations were in themselves contradictory and competing. And this intuition, for those of you interested in urban things and, and geography, uh, you, you probably know that this intuition has been recently developed by such scholars as Aigua Ong, Aigua, uh, Ong or Ananya Roy and Abdul Malik Simon in their writings about the worlding of cities. But my concept of the world making is also impacted by my reading of Edouard Brisson. Through his experience in the Martinique and in France, Brisson described the world uh, as the multiplication of possibilities of connections and the potential for both emancipation and violence that they entail. And so his question was very precise, and his question was this. How to think the world beyond this expansionist understanding that we have inherited from the colonial period? How to think the world beyond an expansionist vision? And uh, I am thinking here uh, in particular about Bisson's reading of the plantation system as a place of encounter between various practices of world making. And in a longer, longer version of this talk, I would elaborate on this, but, but uh, maybe we can come back to that in the, in the discussion. But you know, learning from these various impulses, in the book I study socialist world making, which was both distinct from and yet intertwined with uh, other world making uh, practices, notably colonial and globalist world making. And the term global socialism, which I, in, the way, in the way how I use it in the book, refers to various, sometimes antagonistic, projects of global cooperation that were practiced by institutions and individuals from socialist countries and their counterparts in Africa and Asia. And they did so, they did practice them within state sanctioned frameworks of socialist internationalism, but sometimes they transgressed these frameworks. And this concept of world making structures the book. So after the introductory chapter, the second chapter focuses on Ghana under uh, Kwame Nkrumah. In the early 1960s, Ghana was one of the key places uh, for the Soviets to promote the socialist model of development. And I study how modern architecture in Ghana was co-produced by Ghanaians and Eastern Europeans, and how they tap into resources circulating in networks that conveyed competing visions of worldwide cooperation and solidarity. The second chapter uh, focuses on Nigeria in the 1970s. In difference to Ghana, Nigerian elites were generally hostile towards socialism. They invited Eastern Europeans, as I mentioned already, not in order to import the socialist model of development, but in order to stimulate economic development more generally in that intertwinement with Western aspects. Accordingly, rather than referring to socialism, Eastern European architects working in Nigeria sought other ways to make sense uh, of, the, of the task at hand. And I study in this chapter how these architects and planners imagined the worlds which they share with Africans. In particular, uh, they pointed at this longer experience of foreign domination over Eastern Europe and Africa during the long 19th century. And they claimed that it contributed to economic backwardness and cultural dependency in both regions. Importantly, the way how I approach this debate is not simply about question of propaganda or, le or the question of legitimization of the work of Eastern Europeans in Nigeria. What was at stake was rather the use of specific architectural tools and techniques from Eastern Europe and from Eastern European architectural culture. And these techniques responded to that supposedly shared experience between uh, Eastern Europe and Nigeria. And I'm arguing this by means of three case studies. On the top uh, left, uh, this is the Hungarian regional planning methods, which were used in the city of Calabar and uh, environment, the environment. Secondly, the use of Polish survey methods in vernacular wooden architecture, 
mine is mostly wooden architecture, which you see in the top right, that's actually not a wooden building, or not entirely a wooden building, it's a Friday Masters area. And then I look at the weight of the, of, of the construction site, how the construction site is organized, uh, and the Yugoslav Nigerian project uh, in Lagos. So this chapter shows how Eastern Europeans instrumentalized historical analogies between Eastern Europe and West Africa. But quite importantly, it also reveals the limits to these analogies. It also reveals the racialized dynamics that inform socialist world making. And so what reverberated in particular in these dynamics, as I stressed in this chapter, were the ambiguities of Eastern Europe's own colonial history. And uh, that um, included notably colonial fantasy and the practice of uh, the so-called internal colonization in interwar Poland, which is probably quite important to mention in the end here. Now, chapter four uh, is about something completely different. Chapter four discusses world making as an overarching practice of international trade. It shows how Eastern European and Iraqi architects and planners and contractors contributed to the urbanization of Baghdad in Iraq. And they did so by instrumentalizing the differences between the emerging global market of design and construction services on the one hand, and on the other hand, the political economy of state socialism. And I'm thinking here of a very specific element of that political economy, such as, for instance, the incompatibility of Eastern European currencies, or the practice of barter, so, you know, the exchange of good for good without the mediation of money. For instance, in this case, the practice of exchanging a building for crude oil. And uh, in the chapter, uh, I show how these types of transactions, like barters or petrobarter, if you like, transactions facilitated specific design methodologies, materialities, programs, and the technopolitics of construction in Europe. And the last chapter, chapter five, discusses uh, several buildings designed by Bulgarians and other Eastern Europeans in Abu Dhabi and Kuwait City during the final decade of the Cold War. Uh, by then, state uh, socialist enterprises were able to integrate into the Western dominated market of design and construction services in the Gulf. I argue that they were able to do so based on the longer experience in North Africa and the Middle East in the networks of socialist internationalism. As you know, the Gulf is a paradigmatic example for architecture's globalization at the turn of the century. And so by focusing on the Gulf, this, this chapter, this book, inscribe socialist internationalism into a genealogy of architecture's globalization. And let me conclude with this final image. It shows Budapest uh, from the house of one of the protagonists of my book, the Hungarian architect Charles Polony. Many of my interviews were conducted in similar places, namely, in single family houses located in the suburbs of Budapest, but also Belgrade, Bucharest, Prague, Sofia, Krakow, Warsaw, and Wrocław. During my interviews, entering these houses, I quite often heard the phrase, and I quote, I bought this house thanks to my work on foreign contracts. And this suggests that the urbanization in Eastern Europe during the Cold War, and in particular suburbanization, should be understood from the perspective of decolonization and the cooperation with uh, countries in the global south. This cooperation resided not only in financial transfers, but also in other flows, flows of oil, of knowledge, of technology, and of consumption patterns. As you know by now, my book is about Accra, Lagos, Baghdad, Abu Dhabi, and Kuwait City. But I also think that this perspective from the South opens up new views on the urbanization of Eastern Europe during the Cold War and after. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lukas. And uh, I, I have um, 
two questions, one for each of you, and then I would like to open the floor um, to our dear audience. Um, so it, both of them, uh, both of these questions concern methodology and meta level, and uh, yeah, this, this is my hobby horse, so please bear with me uh, on this. Uh, uh, and the first question, and, and just to really to pick up also from kind of where you left off, and uh, it's more of, I would like to ask you to speak a little bit more, Mikash, in terms of um, what we already somehow we are discussing informally as well. So this absence that you mentioned uh, is, is how you can actually work with this absence and what do you do with it? And I think the, one of the, we, what is really missing from the field of art, which, which you do, and I think this is, this is a very crucial les lesson, I think, and I would like to ask you if you could speak a bit more to the fact, to how you approach Eastern Europe. Because I think, uh, that is, because I think you do go beyond this simplistic understanding of, of the view, of view from Eastern, so just looking at the relations of Eastern Europe and the global south. So it's not just, not just looking at the relations, but as I understand what you're really trying to do is to look at all these global connections and then find the place of Eastern Europe within it. So your center of analysis or, or the main protagonist, so to say, of your research is not Eastern Europe, but understanding the place somehow um, of Eastern Europe. So it's, it's a much more complex analysis than just a view from Eastern Europe, so to reverse, um, yeah, what is, so, it's, so it's not a view from the Eastern Europe in that sense, but uh, yeah, so it's my, like, so my simplistic interpretation of it, but if you could speak a bit more to this methodological aspect of it. Um, yes, well, well, thank you. I, um, uh, may, maybe anecdotally it's, it's uh, uh, you know, since anecdote is like a privileged unit of analysis in, in our region. Uh, anecdotes, anecdotally, I started this um, work 12 years ago, and one of the kind of key milestones for me was was uh, was an exhibition which I did for the Museum of Modern Art in Warsaw. And at that time, I was speaking about Central Europe. And um, then I was presenting, you know, and then I started, you know, going to the protagonists of my of my uh, book, which are the cities. I want to believe that the protagonists of my book are those five cities. And when I arrived to Lagos, I was asked to give a talk, and, and then I was asked to you know, write an abstract, and I submitted it, and they said, like, it's great. But the one thing which is a bit strange is that you write about Central Europe, and if we keep it, then people in Lagos will think that you are going to talk about Switzerland. So I was wondering if you could, run, you know, change uh, to Eastern Europe, and I changed that, and it stayed like this. And I think it's quite important because it tells, you know, it's a, it's a real dilemma, right? On the one hand, we want to we want to describe things in a way that we want to describe regions, or we describe we want to describe people in the way they describe themselves, right? And clearly, in a place like Poland, people would describe themselves as Central Europeans. And so that's a rule. And there, but there is another rule, and that's the rule of your audience. Who is your audience, right? And I thought, that was a tough choice. Who is, who is your readership? But then I, you know, starting working in Accra, you know, traveling to Accra many times, um, you know, working in, in, in Lagos, working in Baghdad, having long discussions with Baghdadi planners who ask incredibly detailed questions about like, one, the min why is it like this that the Polish planners decided that the minimal plot in Baghdad is 300 square meters? You know, this kind of question. And so after asking all this, I thought that probably the people who are really interested in this stuff are not the people in Warsaw, but the people in Accra, Lagos, and at least, you know, uh, uh, proportionally speaking, the majority would be, of, would be in, in the cities I work on. And this is why I, I stayed with Eastern Europe which is not exactly an answer to your question, but I think maybe it's a good one. Thank you very much. And, and again, a more methodological question to Zoltan that you also refer to uh, 
a bit in, 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 your, in your talk, but I would like to ask you to tease out a little bit more this question of the relevancy of decolonization. So how, in what ways it can be used and, and in what ways uh, cannot. And also we talked about this uh, <coughs> in many of our uh, work, working hours and discussions, but I think it's, it's, uh, it's also somehow the elephant in the room in a way. Uh, so yeah, if you could if, if you could talk about this, both also the decolonization as a concept and as a practice, and what does it mean to look look at it, or how does it work in Eastern Europe? Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's a tricky one. Uh, we never had colonies, uh, so we have no colonial history, uh, so there's nothing to do. Uh, we could say that, but actually, uh, I, I gave a few interviews in Hungary, and I wrote, uh, we also gave interviews, and we got criticized by some right-wing uh, propagandists who immediately jumped on this, that, okay, so are we importing decolonization as done in the West, right? And what's interesting is that these moments of histories of decolonization are not coming from the West, or not always coming from the West, right? So these histories are also about how like Afro-Asian decolonization, ideas of anti-colonialism, anti-racism, uh, influenced Eastern Europeans, and vice versa, was there any connection? And it's precisely not looking at the West, I think, is how to not import versions or frameworks of decolonization uh, as propagated or practiced in mostly Anglo-American uh, you know, metropoles and centers of knowledge production. So that's, I think, what we need to contest. So how to do decolonization, which is not the, uh, the way as it is done in the West, because you're just reproducing post-colonial studies, which is very centered on the core and maybe interactions with the periphery, but then Eastern Europe is missing. So I think the most important thing to do first is to revisit our own histories and not uh, speak about uh, explicitly, and we didn't speak about decolonialism or decolonization explicitly connected to this exhibition. So this was not supposed to be a decolonial exhibition, although it's strongly connected to these ideas and criticism. Uh, because we, we do not want to import this type of uh, critique. So focusing on our own histories and asking not, you know, whether we were colonized or who was colonized by whom and this type of dichotomy, which is a barrier to understanding our positions in global colonialism, but asking the question how we relate it to global colonialism, because then you could see these various positions, which I also try to show, Sometimes these positions shift. So, like Ilish Kotzer, uh, anti colonist, and then also a Zionist colonist. Uh, or, like, uh, uh, even in Miklos Radnoti's poetry, he wrote po poems on Columbus, for example, right? But he was sympathizing with the black African position because of his Jewishness. So, we could go on and on, and also during socialism, you had these various positions. So we first have to rehistoricize from a global perspective before asking the moral and critical questions of uh, how to decolonize. Can I ask uh, something to this? I mean, from, from my material, which is mainly historical material, on, I mean, I was very interested in how Eastern Europeans in the areas I work on uh, actually contributed to the decolonization processes, right? For example, the process of Africanization of architecture and construction. And their role was crucial. In many levels, on many levels, for example, in education, where in many uh, in West African architectural departments, which were established in the very last years of the colonial rule, and of course can we inherit as the British curriculum, and many, and many, I mainly work on British, uh, West Africa, British, uh, British curriculum, you know, British staff, uh, Eastern Europeans, uh, not only them, but a lot of them, uh, largely replaced uh, the British um, teachers, and also to some extent, you know, undermined the hegemony of the of the British based curriculum. Now, but they did that in a, I think, a really interesting way, namely what I argue as weak actors. Nevertheless, they 
very rarely they were never in a position for example to to replace the type of the speech that the british enjoyed simply because they because they did not have that type of cachet the type the the type of prestige in the eyes of the west african counterparts and so they 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 had a very particular and i think really interesting role of a kind of a bridge which between the colonial period and what happened later sometimes this bridge became longer than expected sometimes it lasts until today but nevertheless the idea was never and and at the practice more importantly the practice you know as seen but by african administrators by african decision makers uh the 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 the, the eastern european competence was seen as inferior very often to uh, uh the british one but it is because of that they they had a crucial role to play in the decolonization precisely because they were they never reached that type of level of influence which i think is a really interesting dynamics uh, and i think that also uh, you know opens up a number of discussions which are very very uh, relevant today about about you know the type of hegemony that that you know possibly was coming from eastern europe at the time can I have just a short comment and I'll shut up and just uh, <laughs> pass it back? Because connected to this, uh, uh, first I just wanted to say that it, yeah, if you're interested, we have a two part interview with Lukash where we talk about these, we are weak actors in these issues. Uh, so, just decolonialism, uh, it has been highly politicized and also captured by right wing conservative governments and political actors. So, it has become, it has emerged as, um, an important element in political discourse in Eastern Europe in the past few years. So it's really interesting to focus on that. But just what I wanted to say as a question to all of you, uh, Lukas talked about audience. I think that's a key aspect. So who are we actually talking to? Who are we having a conversation or dialogue with? And I find important that important problem that we don't have this dialogue with the Ghanaians, the Indians, or Nigerians. And I, what I find fascinating about Lukash's work is exactly opening up this dialogue and doing like joint projects connecting the, the archives. And my question is, why is this denial, if you talked about this during dinner the uh, day before, uh, uh, is that why is this denial of these histories? And isn't there this uh, hidden aspect of race involved? So I'd be interested to talk about this now. And this is the time that I would like to open up. Or who would like to open up? Yes. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Uh, well, I mean, thanks a lot for uh, this uh, wonderful presentation and everything. It, uh, I'm sure you're sharing a lot of insights that many people here waited to hear for a while, hopefully. And uh, since you're talking about dialogue with other cultures, now we're in dialogue here with Ukrainians, which is quite uh, amazing because I'm sure localization and uh, you know practical application in the end is key. My to get to the point, my uh, question to you would be, you know, with the insights that you have gathered and that you share with us in uh, your books, knowledge, studies, research, and presentation right here, what do you actually? What would you like? Two of you would like to see as a practical application of your findings, specifically here, for example, in the Ukrainian context, which, uh, well, you know, I'm an artist, so I like practical application of things and concepts into something visual, cultural, whatnot. So how would you like to see a ripple from your words go through this culture right here, through Ukraine? Um, yes, thank you. I mean, I have spent actually a couple of days uh, in Kiev. I participated in a really interesting conference uh, at the beginning of, of this week, uh, which focused on uh, architecture mainly in Kiev, but then also in Ukraine and, 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 and in the region from the 80s, right? Which is a very particular and in example, a lot of really important and interesting objects in the Podil in this in this city, right? Which is really um, quite eye-opening for me to to look at these buildings, of which 
I have very little idea of people. And so I think that, you know, so we did discuss, um, you know, what all, what the type of a perspective that I bring, what can that contribute to, to the discussions here? And, you know, you talk about your practice, basically my practice with education, right? I'm a, I'm a teacher, that's, that's who I am, and I'm a scholar, but, but I think that the, the real, and so I have, I, you know, I have arguments and concepts which I believe in, and I what need to, and I, 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 I develop, and I show their relevance for broader debates. For instance, in urban geography, very, my, a very recent paper about, about uh, you know, how we, how knowledge is produced through comparison, right? So comparative, how you compare cities. And traditionally, uh, that comparative knowledge production was uh, developed through comparison with, you know, big Western metropolises. So, you know, cities were compared and knowledge was gained through comparison with Paris, with London, with New York, with Los Angeles, maybe with Berlin. And so, you know, the contribution from this work was like, what happens if we start comparing Baghdad and Warsaw, Tashkent and Accra, uh, Kiev, I interviewed a number of uh, architects, including architects from Uganda and architects from Ghana who studied in Kiev. So what happens if, you know, you spend seven years, they usually spend seven years, usually, you know, right, because they needed to learn a language. So they spend a lot of time in Kiev, in this city, and say, what does it mean for their understanding of their own context? In particular, you know, after the end of the Cold War, where, where you know, a lot of the discourses which they learned here were questioned. So I, I leave that open, this is you know, a huge debate. And the second example in my first half, namely as an educator, I think there's a lot of interest today, including, you know, I see this in archi young architectural and urban historians in this city, uh, in, uh, you know, contributing to what sometimes is called global architectural history, like how to get rid of that type of curriculum and understanding of what architecture is that, you know, starts with, uh, you know, the Greeks and the Romans, and then there is a cathedral somewhere in between, and then we end, you know, and again, in the same, strangely enough, in the same five, say, cities are the kind of most important examples of architecture. And so how do we do it, and how we do it, and I will end with this, not simply, you know, by adding examples, because, you know, books cannot be too big, but how, to, how do we do it by reconceptualizing some of these concepts? And the concept which I try to reconceptualize today is the concept of the world, right? The global. So how to think the global, but through the concept of world making. Yeah. Yeah. You, you have some. If if um, if also, I mean, I can just address this from the perspective of art. Uh, <clears throat> I think it's also as I, as I mentioned in, in the beginning. So I think also one of the crucial questions is uncovering these histories, but then how. You, as an artist, how you work with these materials, how, how, how you can be sensitive, uh, uh, for instance, the questions of race, uh, how, how, how you, uh, yeah, how, how, so I think this is also like a sensitivity, if I may say, that I think uh, in general, in Eastern Europe, it's, it's, it's something that we need to practice more, how, how to be more sensitive to, uh, uh, issues of race, I think. So, um, I think that's, um, yeah, that's, I th that's also one perspective, I think. Thank you for the question. Actually, yes, I think we all are very interested in practical application. It's actually part of our work. Uh, the exhibition project was part of this. Actually, the exhibition uh, looks, it has visuals and you present stuff. But it's also a platform, and I had amazing uh, discussions with uh, people at the Budapest exhibition, where everyone was coming with their anecdotes and stories about Ghana and students. And I had an uncle who worked on this uh, project in Syria, etc., uh, etc. Et so, like opening up a platform physically, in space to actually come together and uh, and uh, show a new model or way for knowledge production 
is, I think, one important practice in thinking of the exhibition as a network of connecting these uh, uh, positions. But also, I think education, of course, but as Esther said, race, and I would also add class is important in the critical pedagogies, uh, which would also entail like globalizing these perspectives. Just to add an exam example, I, te I taught at Milestone Institute in Hungary, which is a private institution training secondary school students for entrance exams to the prestigious UK university, which is a very colonial position. And I taught post-colonial geography. And what I tried to do, if you teach post-colonial geography, you will like copy the Anglo-American Canaan in Hungary and teach them how to you know, behave and how to study in Cambridge, for example. So I based it on Eastern European colonial history, or Eastern European knowledge and their specific Hungarian knowledge to empower them to then, if they go to the UK, criticize the Canaan based on the Eastern European knowledge because the British have no idea about the East European connections. Uh, and it's also, I think, just to list an issue of resources, uh, which is also very West-centric. We, uh, I have a book contract with Cambridge University Press. We tend to get jobs in Western institutions to, uh, it's about prestige, uh, it's about institutionalism, and I think that we should also try to contest these prestige positions, which is, a difficult thing to do in academia. Uh, but it's worth to do it through these kind of practical projects and also to use our Eastern European positions. I'm not sure if we have, but I guess we do have an Eastern European position uh, strategically in these dialogues. Uh, and lastly, I think finding shared viewpoints. Uh, just to share one anecdote, I had a discussion with the Caribbean uh, uh, artist who works in the US and like how to have a dialogue in terms of artistic projects. And we found, uh, um, I started talking about, he talked about Rastafarianism and also uh, uh, Zionism and I mentioned to him, oh well, Eastern Europeans were very active in Zionism and these kind of ideologies, which are also connected to colonialism because many of the Jewish uh, 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 people uh, who, some of them were Hungarian, fantasized about getting colonies in Africa or settling in Africa. It was not just Israel and Palestine. Immediately we started a conversation about colonialism connected to Jewishness and also Zionism. And we found that shared positions to, to the Caribbean perspective too, uh, through Africa and through these kind of activities of Hungarians. Uh, so we just have to start a dialogue where we can share these viewpoints. The problem is that we are not in Eastern Europe. So, to start. Thank you. Thank you for the presentations and discussion. Uh, so I have a question uh, more to Zoltan and Esther. Because uh, when Lukas, uh, you spoke, you talked about your audience, which is uh, maybe primarily then in Ghana and uh, or, or, or maybe also in Warsaw, but then in Ghana, right? And and the book has been, you know, circulating, and your research has been kind of also now focusing more in in Ghana in archives there. And I was wondering about the work of you and the Transparitory uh, Movement Exhibition and why and how and whether and if that could have that relevance in, in those countries uh, in the Global South that you're working with. Because now, I guess, it's been shown in Budapest and now in Kiev and, you know, and have you thought about that kind of leap and how would that be interesting and relevant and, uh, within the, yeah, the shared histories that, that it presents? Yeah, so, so in terms of, of, of the artwork, so most of the artists uh, who are presented in the exhibition are from the Global South, so to say in, 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 in quotation marks. Uh, but also, for instance, one of the, the hardships of, of, of the exhibition was that there aren't many artworks that deal with the connections or parallels or any, any that deal with, speak to these issues of Eastern Europe and the global south, or how they are connected. And 
Yeah, so, so I, I think, and, and also I, so I would just maybe like to mention the example of Monica de Miranda, who, uh, who is a Portuguese artist of Angolan descent. And uh, this is the, basically the only piece that was uh, produced, or it wasn't commissioned, but it was made for the exhibition itself. And we had, uh, Monica was uh, in a residency program in Budapest, and uh, and uh, we met, and then we were we were already had this idea of the exhibition, and we started talking with Monica. And uh, in terms of of uh, what the relevancy to her, what Eastern Europe means to her, or why 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 she first of all why she came to Budapest, and what what is uh, uh, why is it important to her, what it, what these connections mean to her, and basically she had one. <coughs> Her answer was, and this is basically the the base of of the work that she produced, which is a which is a more lyrical and poetic eight minute vi uh, video piece that's in the exhibition. So she basically said that the heritage of Marxism Leninism, which actually brought Angola independence, is so that's that's one thing that she's interested in, and and, and why it failed. So basically, we started talking about uh, how these revolutionary ideas, when they come to fruition, then they fail. <laughs> so how, how basically the, the regime change doesn't really happen, or, or it, it, it happens in a failed uh, uh, way, and how it gets depoliticized. And, and also, I think it's just because of, um, and also, I mean, she mentioned other things. What, uh, for instance, how Marxism-Leninism was important in Angola, and the, and then, then the ruling party, the MPLA, just because it it united the different uh, skin colors, and and so that they could jointly uh, fight uh, for independence, and it was not, it because it was based on the class struggle and not uh, on on racial divisions. Uh, but to make my uh, answer or to wrap up my answer. Uh, so I think it was a special case uh, to ask also Monica why why is it relevant because it was clear to us and this is you know the methodological question that I'm I'm fixated on it was clear to us why it's it's super interesting to us to think about that you know Marxism has its many inheritors and not just in the Eastern Bloc but uh, in many other places of the world including Angola, uh, but uh, but. Why was it speaking to uh, Monica? And 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 the other yeah, and just in, another aspect is is the generational one. So the 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 woman in the film is is a Czech Angolan or the Czechoslovak Angolan uh, woman who was basically born out of this historical relationship because Czeslo Czechoslovakia was a, uh, an importer of weapons uh, and military hardware including to Angola. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so what's, what happens to the second generation uh, uh, after the Cold War? So, yeah, so, yeah, it's just one example, but this is a rare uh, example. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so I think this is, and, and I think this is also systemic of, in terms of reading together post-socialism and post-colonialism, because it's still researchers of post-socialism who uh, are at the forefront um, of this. Just very briefly, uh, give us money, <laughs> and then we can travel. Uh, no, actually, the, uh, this project is a grassroots, so the Biennale uh, in Budapest, as we, w which we started, totally grassroots movement, uh, is different to do, and, and you know, difficult to do uh, such exhibition project from this position. But it's also very enlightening uh, and uh, politically empowering. But uh, with, uh, what I found is we need to have more conversations uh, on site, so the exhibition itself is not enough. But there was lots of you know, needs for conversation, to the interpretation, so what are we seeing and how to understand this. What I found the problem in uh, the, uh, is that um, the South American connection was very strong. They really wanted to, okay, let's feature this there. But they were Hungarians, 
right? So this kind of nationalism we produce locally, the spaces uh, in the diaspora is something to evade. But I think uh, it was important, it was great to see this kind of shared peripheral positions of artists and how to do art, uh, which we featured historically too, but was also you know, practiced uh, through the exhibition. But I also think that Lukash uh, was involved some you know, exhibition projects too, so if you would like to add something into question. I know that the our exhibition was your exhibition, you did. Yeah, so we did an exhibition in Accra about uh, various projects for a very particular site called the Marine Drive, which is today being developed in a sort of Dubai manner. And so the role of this exhibition was very strategic to show not so much, you know, to show what was there or what wasn't there or what kept, could have been there, but to show that there are various competing imaginations of what urbanism in Accra could be, and to kind of, with the hope that this can perhaps question some of the proposals today. Thanks you, uh, for your presentations. And one uh, um, Dishem Zoltanhut. So I have a question for Zoltan. Um, you described um, these historic links between uh, Hungary and the global, so-called global South in the socialist times and the left left-wing authors who were also like connecting. And these issues now are uh, mostly left out, forgotten by the official discourse. But what it does instead, uh, is there, uh, how it imagines this history of uh, Hungary and this uh, colonial and post-colonial global south. Maybe given the nature of like current government is very right-wing nationalistic xenophobic, maybe it prefers some kind of colonial adventurer like um, Laszlo Olmasi or Armin Van Beri, uh, or it focuses on these diasporas, or it simply also uh, just uh, forgets about this part of the world. So how is this history is remembered now? Yes, great question. Uh, I could talk for an hour about this, so I'll just give a few brief examples, but I also wanted to return to a previous question, what the exhibition would uh, do somewhere else or in the global south. I think the aspect of materiality and how uh, material relations are reproduced by the exhibition locally. So what does the exhibition do in material sense is a very important question. So not to be exploitative of, of locals, etc. Et uh, yeah, so there are, like in Hungary, there's right now running the, uh, what's, right now we have the Hunting Expo running, which we also talked about, uh, which revisits these kind of colonial relations. So the hunters who, and also about these socialist periods because many of these hunters were rehabilitated in order to keep up the elite practice of hunting, the knowledge, the expertise must be used. So these connections to Africa, for example, totally uh, the critical discourse is totally neglected. And if you raise your voice, then you're attacking a very strong nationalist king on of this. So very strongly protected. So for example, Zsigmond Széchenyi, the noted hunter, Hungary, uh, it's really hard to start a critical dialogue. And the other example is the Indian play, so playing Native American Indians, which also has been in the past few years very strongly institutionalized, this memory. So the collections have been, um, collections have been processed now and they publish books on this, which is totally unreflective on colonial or racial relations, or, or how is this not reproducing some form of coloniality. Uh, it's also because it's, uh, we have this anti-communist uh, stance. So um, India plane was connected to criticizing the socialist regime. So for example, some of these uh, are because of this, so some of this lack of criticism is because of this anti-communist nationalist position. Um, yeah, uh, so just to you know, wrap up, uh, we look at travel writing in, in my research and with my co-authors, we have a 
recent uh, uh, publication with James Mark and a few other people. Uh, I mentioned James Mark because he was mentioned previously here uh, as a co-author. Um, and we focus on Eastern European uh, travelogues and how that you can see uh, during, even during the socialist period in this anti-colonialist propaganda, you, you see these inherent colonialist perspectives and also some of the inherent colonial frameworks which Lukas talked about that somehow uh, it's in some cases you have this kind of colonial viewpoint or system reproduced during the socialist era to various degrees. Uh, I could go on and on. If you'd like something to add. Yeah, I'm really sorry because uh, we have to leave it there because we have to rearrange uh, our technical setup before the next event. So thank you so much again, Lucas, Zoltan, Esther. So we will come back uh, in 15 minutes.